this talk, um, I think it's only been given 10 minutes and it's really just so that you hear the words again, so that when you go back into training, if you're going to start in the next few um, weeks and months, that you've had uh, just a prompt that you've visited some of these familiar things before. So nothing here I'm expecting to teach anything to anyone, but just maybe as like a gentle reminder about um, palliative radiotherapy um, and we'll cover cord compression, bone metastases, um, bleeding and brain metastases as just simple things. And the aims are really just for you um, just to think about palliative radiotherapy. And I think the four things to take away from it, or what I thought I'd, uh, I'd just need to prompting to remember for palliative radiotherapy is what is the aim of your treatment? Is it purely symptomatic? Um, in which case you want to give um, the least invasive, fewest attendances to hospital, easiest radiotherapy that you can. And in COVID times, it's even more important because we want to reduce frequency of attendances to hospital. Are you trying to get local control as well? Because someone might have a little otherwise burden of disease. So um, one case I'm going to mention later is in a testicular uh, cancer patient where they ha might have lots of disease but you're trying to target certain certain bits and, and even though it you know you you so you might want to increase the dose um, and then that takes us on to um, how we prepare for a palliative radiotherapy treatments make sure you're documenting things thinking about your patient um, comorbidities complications um, that complicating factors sorry and if they've had any previous radiotherapy before. And then taking all those things in context and patient issues, the um, tumour considerations and things like COVID or what your preference is at your institution to define what kind of dose you give and how you give it. And lastly, I, you know, when putting together this talk, I realised that you know, more than ever in palliative care, there's no real right answer. Everything is... a um, about discussing the different possibilities and then choosing one that fits right. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, so cord compression, I'm not gonna go over it because I'm assuming everyone knows how to treat cord compression and it's very common and just reminding everyone to get an MRI as quickly as possible and um, go through the algorithm, get a coordinator and, and, and you know, tell whoever's on call um, and do a refer a patient whether or not you think the patient is for surgery or for radiotherapy for audit purposes. Um, and then think about why someone might have radiotherapy rather than surgery if they've got poor prognosis, if they've got widespread metastatic disease. Um, so we all know that if we were gonna treat um, cord compression, we would use a single posterior um, field. And so here for this case, this is just simply reminders and so forth. So this is a 64-year-old gentleman who's got renal cell cancer. He's on his third line of treatment. It's a real case that was just a couple of weeks ago. And so you can see that, um, I don't know if you can see this little dot on the screen, um, but this is his disease in the middle of the field here, and it tracks down. Um, that's actually, this is where his main site of disease is, but he's had an operation. So if you can see where the green um, bubble, the green circle is obviously highlighting where he's still got lots of disease. And this is metal work and this is metal work. And this is a post-operative scenario. Someone has a metal plate all the way down here and it's fixing into, that's even a little bit metal plate, fixing into his vertebrae. So when we're giving this radiotherapy, what considerations do we need to make? What dose are we going to give? Um, are we going to cover all the metal work? Does it matter that he's got renal cell carcinoma? What's his other disease like? Um, just as a reminder, so are, has he had previous radiotherapy? Well, most of you will have seen that down here in his lumbar area, he's got all of this funny business going on and he's actually previously had saber to a lesion down here in his lumbar spine. So this patient, we're gonna worry about whether there's any overlap of disease uh, for radiotherapy fields. Um, actually, in this case, there's not, which is helpful. 
And then you want to think um, dosing considerations. And a lot of that is on prognosis. So the school rad trial um, has been reported a few years ago now, and it shows that eight gray in one fraction is as good as 20 in five in terms of achieving good ambulatory status and overall survival. But the, the, we saw that from that trial that the median survival in both arms was about three months, which is quite low. And so the people entering that trial were, had poor prognosis. So it probably isn't suitable to give eight gray in a single fraction for cord compression for all comers. And certainly in uh, my institution, where I'm working at the Royal Marsden at the moment, we've used a lot more of eight in one, certainly over COVID, and particularly for poor prognosis patients, elderly patients, to reduce their attendances to hospital. But in the most part, cord compression, particularly for young people, good prognosis, we're still giving them 20 gray in five fractions uh, as, as much as possible. Um, renal cell carcinoma, we all know, is radio resistant, so that's going to change that dose a bit. And then, of course, I'm just going to use this as an example to talk about uh, retreatment on the next slide, even though he wasn't. And then organs at risk. So um, it's important not to just assume that because I've given you these two slides that that um, box sort of treatment is acceptable because he's got renal cell carcinoma, which means he's previously had a nephrectomy. He's only got one kidney. So even though this is a palliative treatment, we're now going to have to amend that carefully to make sure that we don't make things worse for him. And I just put in the last bit of prompt here about metal work. Whenever there's metal work in your field, what are you going to do about it? You have to think, are we going to cover it all or are we not going to cover it all? So here, his metal work actually comes way above the disease and all the way down. So um, this patient had a two-phase technique. He was treated with this wide field of view initially and then we reduced it slightly so that his last dose was just to the middle three vertebra and that he had 25 and 5 so 20 and 5 to the whole field and then 25 and 5 to the major area of the disease so the 20 and 5 covered the whole of the metal and the you can see the um, field of view here of how we treated so that's the kidney on the right hand side, I don't know if you can see my pointer now, um, on that kidney on the left. So we've, uh, we've saved his kidney there. We've used the MLCs to come off the kidney, off the lung, and then used a box just as we would. So prescribing 25 and 5 daily treatment from um, single posterior field. Okay. So this is just an excuse to mention retreatment and EQD2 just as a reminder, always, always think about previous treatments and radiotherapy, get the previous views, write it on documents, um, uh, compare the previous radiotherapy doses that they ha the patient had. I always convert it to EQD2, but I'm aware some people use bed and that's fine, and then compare that to the tolerances. And then in terms of neuronal recovery and in terms of whether you can use uh, the general tolerances as before, I think that is open for discussion. And um, we're making this slide, I asked lots of people about what they would consider a neuronal recovery to be. And I'm sure uh, we could have a big discussion here about it. Some people have said 30% at one year. Some people have said 50% at six months. So I think it's very wide. Um, in the exams, I would always play it safe and just say none and know your tolerances and that's it. But on a person to person, it might be that you, um, this might be quite an individual discussion on risk, uh, risk and benefit ratio. So if someone has a very poor prognosis, you might, you know, go over the, the normal toler tolerances because you think they won't survive to see the side effects. So that's something just to be aware of. So, um, so the second thing I was going to talk about is bone metastases. So obviously this picture shows, this is a prostate cancer patient who has horrible um, disease in the bones. Actually it's very widespread bony disease, but he complained that he had painful left shoulder. So here, this is a simple field that I put on just to cover the disease in the left shoulder, eight grain, a single fraction, parallel opposed field um, to the mid 
dose to mid-plane dose. And you can see that I've tried to give two centimeter gap between where the disease is and the normal tissue. Um, so, uh, and you can see here the dosimetric effects of that field. So again, thinking of how you're gonna position a patient, particularly if they're in a lot of pain. Um, so you can ask for arms akimbo. So that means arms on hips, um, sticking their arm out away from their chest so that you can make this nice line uh, away from the lung. But if someone's in a lot of pain, you might need to give them painkillers, pre-medication to do that. And also on this slide, I've mentioned a corridor. And it's always nice for limbs just to think about whether you need a corridor. I think if you're treating eight gray in a single fraction for someone who's in a very palliative way, it might not be necessary to have a corridor, but particularly if you're going to higher doses of trying to achieve local control, perhaps even more so if you're treating lower limbs rather than upper limbs, you really need to leave uh, a corridor. In sarcoma, we would say that's a third of the diameter of the circumference so that you can have good lymphovascular um, recovery despite radiotherapy so that you don't have that scarring and the, the risk of lymphedema later on. And certainly in that scenario, when you are going to higher doses, you would look actually at where the lymphovascular bundle is and try and preserve that area if that was at all possible. So ribs, you know, again, we're thinking bone metastases eight in one where possible, but actually, how you go about treating that might be different where it is on the body. So here we've got a posterior um, rib, but if it was anterior, would you use a tangential pair like if you were treating breasts? Um, if it was on an anterior rib where you could feel it and it was palpable, you then might use electrons. And actually um, my experiences in the last few months, we've used many more electrons because it means only one visit to hospital. They don't need a CT planning scan. You can mark them on set. Um, so I've done quite a bit of that. And then SBRT, actually the picture that I've shown here, this is a palliative in image of someone with oligometastatic disease and prostate cancer. And he has had uh, SBRT to this rib lesion. So this is the GTV and the purple is the PTV margin and he'll be treated with SBRT. So um, my prompt here is just to use pacemakers. You know, ribs are on the thorax. So if you've got left-sided rib and you've got pacemakers, um, this is linking in. This is the total bugbear of every registrar, really. When you have a patient with a pacemaker in the field, what do you do? Well, the most important thing is that you write it on the referral so everybody knows and that you get the information from the cardiology team about why they have their pacemaker, if they're pacemaker dependent, what is their risk score? And the best information comes from this RCR guidance, which you can find on the internet really easily. It's only a few pages long, and it will tell you um, about the maximum risk uh, radiotherapy doses if you have a pacemaker or an ICD. And most importantly, um, show us how we can risk categorize our patients and um, then monitor them accordingly during their radiotherapy treatment. So it makes a big difference if you're pacing dependent or independent and what sort of dose is going to go to the um, pacemaker itself. And of course, always involve the cardiology team as you do this. And then this is just a snapshot of that paper and it tells you, it goes through the risk, the low risk, medium, high risk, and then what you need to do. So it's you know not something to memorize necessarily, just, just to be aware of. So thirdly, hemorrhage. Um, I suppose we all know that um, radiotherapy is very good at stopping bleeding in many locations, but if, it, if you've got heavy bleeding, it is not the right treat, treatment because it can take a long time to work. So just like um, for pain, you need to use a lot of analgesia as you use for, for pain um, relief uh, as well as radiotherapy. Here, if you've got any major bleeds, use um, the surgeons and so forth. But if I've, I've given palliative radiotherapy in the context of lung cancer, upper GI, bladder, rectum, and gynae. Um, and I think this is a bit more challenging because you can give different doses to everyone. And because it's palliative, they've got all different um, uh, sizes of fields and so forth. But the basics are to try and keep it as simple as possible, treat the disease, um, and minimize the, the side effects. Um, okay. 
So this case is a case that I've treated in the last few weeks. It's a 58-year-old gentleman with a new diagnosis of bladder cancer. He's got no pus. Oh, he does have significant past medical history of this patient, actually. Um, but he's got an advanced primary. So he came, and if he had no past medical history, any of these, really, uh, you would be able to consider. So any of these doses. So um, 8 in 1 is an absolutely fine dose to treat um, hematuria. The MRC trial uh, showed a 21 in 3 fraction, 21 gray in three fractions on alternate days over one week was just as effective as 30 and 10 over two weeks. But still, often we see 20 and 5 or 30 and 10 are routine palliative doses being used all the time. And then if you want to have a bit more local control, um, 30, 36 and 6, or if you're having that treatment and someone develops side effects so they don't get the last fraction, so that you just get 30 gray in five fractions. That's actually a really good dose. It's got an EQD2, which often is described in our clinic as almost radical. I don't know what that means. It means it's palliative really, but it, you've got really, really very good control. And I've seen lots of people with quite significant hematuria clear up and um, have good uh, many month um, improvement from their cancer symptoms from that. So this 58-year-old, I've put no past medical history, that's a lie, he, had, he was really, um, he'd had a previous stroke and had expressive dysphagia, so he couldn't describe anything that he was thinking or feeling, and it made it very difficult for us to safely give him any chemotherapy, as he would not have been able to describe any side effects to us, particularly during COVID and so forth, and um, he had all these comorbidities, MR and stroke. So for him, we were worried about hyperfractionating treatment, and we gave him something unusual that I hadn't seen before, which is 30 gray and 10 fractions, parallel opposed pair, which the field you can see here. Um, and we gave it in, in the treatment over two weeks, but we actually gave it over three weeks with a week break in the middle. And of course, that's not very effective if you're trying to get dose intense treatment for the best local control. But it's extremely well tolerated in the consultants I work with in neurology they, for, for bladder cancer. They use it quite often for these sort of more frail patients. So there we are. And very simply, we've, I've drawn this out really roughly um, just to give an idea. And then this is a two centimeter margin um, on it um, and trying to just where possible use some MLCs to reduce some of the side effects. Um, okay, I hope I'm doing all right. Um, so the next uh, block is just on brain metastases. So we're going to talk about whole brain and then um, base of skull and choroidal mets. So this is a um, an axial slide. It's it's poor quality image actually, and I'm sorry if you can't see the metastases here. I, I have rung it with a green circle to be as helpful as possible. And um, so this is a 33-year-old hospital pharmacist who had testicular cancer. He had curative, curative intent treatment sort of the year or two before, but it was high-risk disease. And he had recurred and was now on chemotherapy for us for disease in his lungs. And actually, his tumour marks were getting way better. Things were going great direction. And suddenly he said, oh, last night I had this episode where I couldn't find my words. My right arm went weak visual changes, he had to call an ambulance and so forth. And we discovered he had brain metastases and his tumour markers just went sky skyrocketed really quickly. So I think that even though this is not technically palliative, because here we have to open the whole questions of what further treatment do we have if we're treating this with what intent are we going to treat this young man? Is there any room for curative treatment. Um, if, if we don't think there is, because actually he's now progressing on multiple lines and we don't know where he's going to go, can we make sure that we balance the possibilities of curative treatment with making sure he has good palliative care alongside that so that we don't miss out any opportunities and so forth. So it's really important we know about his disease, so we, we staged him, tumour markers, CT chest abdominal pelvis, MRIs, PET scans, everything. And um, the MRI is really important of the brain because usually you will find other disease. 
Um, I've done the um, neuro um, metastatic brain neuro job at the Royal Marsden, just doing um, stereotactic treatments. And always when you do a high res MRI of the brain, you find another met somewhere. So as is, well, not always, but often the case. So um, as is the case with this gentleman where we did find other metastases, Leptomeningeal disease is really important as well because it will change your field. You do not want to do partial brain if someone has leptomeningeal disease because it will recur. This is really important that you start to look um, or you, you, know, you pick up on that if it's in the report if you're, or if you're looking at the scans. And then consider, so with this gentleman, um, can we give whole brain or partial and can we add any other modalities in for treatment? So we ended up, he had multiple sites of disease. He had also a frontal lesion, which isn't shown. Um, so more frontal lesion, which isn't shown on uh, this image. So we had to give him whole brain radiotherapy, but we also then offered him um, SBRT afterwards to consolidate the active sites of disease. So he was still going on and change his systemic treatment. And that is good, both palliative, but also potentially curative in this specific um, event and no for the last point on the slide is always, always remember if you've got brain mets, DVLA, seizures and supportive medication. So you would assume he'd have lots of symptoms and be on steroids, but certainly before you start treatment, you always uh, make sure that they're comfortable and you've got some steroids on. Um, okay, so um, again, we've all given whole brain radiotherapy before. So um, this is what uh, the field that I put on for this gentleman for whole brain radiotherapy, done a collimator twist so that the inferior border, so this inferior field margin is going vaguely through the Reed's baseline. So you'll remember that Reed's baseline goes through the superior orbital ridge, down through the uh, external auditory meatus, and then through. And this one is a bit lower, and that's because, because it's potentially radical. I really don't want to miss out on anything else. So not only am I going to check sorry, on the um, sagittal views, just to look at, make sure it looks good. I'm also going to check actually to see whether I've covered the cribriary form plate and the temporal load. So these areas, or it may be even better seen here, these areas which are often neglected down there where you don't get your 95% coverage if you're not slightly generous. And here, this is a slightly different axial view. You can see it's not quite mid-plane because the lens is here, so I've gone through the eye. And just to say, you know, think about it but if you've got either very poor prognosis patient or a cure, potentially curative one like this the lens dose doesn't really matter so we i've tried always to avoid it but i'm always told that work well you know if you got cataracts we'd be delighted because it meant you'd live as long um and then doses again 20 and 5 13 10 this is very patient dependent you can't really go wrong so um, this gentleman had 30 and 10 over two weeks, and then he had his SBRT over that after that. And the side effects I've written there, and I'm sure you all know, so fatigue, hair loss, skin change, toxicity, nausea and vomiting, making sure he's got lots of pre-meds and there's somnolence effects. And for this young patient, we gave him advice about, you know, IQ um, uh, uh, and those more difficult conversations about thinking um, long term if he was to have radiotherapy now and live another 40 years. So um, this is a base of skull. Um, so really just um, flying through so you see all these images again, get really familiar. So as a common um, sort of uh, dis a patient that might have base of skull disease, this is a 66 year old lady who has ER positive her two positive for breast cancer, and she presents with multiple cranial nerve palsies. So you're instantly thinking, could this be base of skull? And of course, the MRI is going to show you where the disease is. And the MRI might be helpful as well um, to show any bulk of disease, make sure that you're going to keep it in your field. So anyone having whole brain, I should say, is going to have a shell to have treatment and be comfortably supine. You don't do very much uh, in palliative care of moving a um, neck, of course, a comfortable position. And again, we're going to draw Reed's baseline, and I think it's really nicely sh shown here on these sort of x ray images. So, um, right down from the superior orbital ridge, external auditory meatus, and out. 
and you go right back from the back of the orbit all the way back to make sure that you include all of this base of skull here so with a good um, uh, a good margin and then you go from your reed's baseline and go out here we've done three centimeters each side you know two to three centimeters at least so when you're when you're giving out um so to cover all of that area and here you can see the actual images with the doses um to, to show good coverage and that 20 and 5 over one week um so lateral posed images to mid plane dose and so lastly here this is just to to say to a 50 year old with ER positive um, breast cancer who's on an astrosol has visual changes just in one eye and an MRI showed a choroidal metastasis. So it's quite hard, I think, here on the CT images to see any choroidal metastases. So um, look back at the diagnostic imaging or any imaging for, well, for all disease, you know, and palliatives, of course. And um, uh, when you put him on the field of view. So the choroidal met when I learned it, it was all about um, a posted stamp and the automatic field would be a five by five field from um, the, you know, um, here behind the lens and the orbits and coming across. But here you can see that we use the um, imaging that we have and actually reduce the size of the field because we know exactly where it is. And we want to minimize the toxicity in this patient. So that's absolutely fine to do. And then you want to, as you, um, you want to make sure that you're not going to go through the contralateral lens as you do it. So if you're going to, particularly if we're going to treat this eye with such a high dose, we want to make sure that we um, save the next one as much as possible. So you can either do that with a collimator twist or a half beam block. So your divergent beam is your back, your sort of posterior beam. Um, so you have good control over where your dose is going. Okay. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is just with bone metastases um, is that there was a paper which came out sort of a week or two ago about whether we should be giving um, steroids to reduce the pain and whether if you get a flare of pain, whether steroids help. And the answer is no, they don't. So giving any amount of steroids does not help the flare of pain afterwards. So make sure that whatever you're giving your palliative radiotherapy for, you're treating the patient's symptoms appropriately beforehand. So if they've got pain, give them analgesia, lots of anti-sickness. And of course, if you're treating anything in the abdomen, the stomach, you think they might get some nausea, giving them some anti-emetics beforehand, large volume um, beforehand, uh, reminding the patients about the potential side effects, coughs and so forth, so that um, uh, they know what to expect. Okay. All right, so that's um, the sort of things I hope we've covered very briefly. Um, any questions? 